G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another trade period analysis video, this time taking a look at uh, some of the individual targets that each club's recruited and uh, sort of making an assessment of which ones will have the most impact in season 2024 for their new club. Now obviously I've done a heap of coverage over the trade period, done some analysis pieces, did a Q&A yesterday for you guys, as well as a winners and losers video where I literally go through all 18 teams and assess their total ins and outs and how they did overall. But today we're going to look more at a player focus and see how those players are likely to go in terms of impacting their new team next season. Before I crack into it, appreciate all the support on the channel lately. It's had a wonderful period of growth. If there's anyone that is enjoying the content and is watching right now that hasn't subscribed, please do me a favor and hit subscribe. It would really mean a lot to me and also uh, it really helps me in the algorithm point of view. So may have a cheeky goal of getting to 24,000 subscribers by the draft period, but we'll see how we go. All right, so how I've grouped this video is I've got a number of players that I feel very confident are gonna have a big impact uh, in their new season at the new club. And uh, there's probably a group of four or five players in that group. And and then there's a bunch of players that I will have as a speculative group that I think are a decent chance and have the potential to really impact next year. Uh, this is mostly a focus on a season one. So for instance, probably haven't I haven't included Tom Dode in this because he's probably not going to be in the Brisbane Lions side until the back end of next season. So while he is likely to become a key player of that defense um, in the medium term, I think next year we'll give him a bit of a mulligan. So I didn't include him in this analysis. But what I'll start with is uh, the Sydney Swans recruits of both Taylor Adams and Brody Grundy. I, I don't think you can say separate these two. They're both going into the same, you know, on-ball division, so to speak. And Grundy obviously comes in and fills a gap in um, in the as a number one ruck. And obviously things didn't really work out for him at Melbourne playing as a second ruck behind Max Gorn. But you feel like there's potential for him at Sydney to really thrive in that role because the last time he played a full season as number one ruck in, uh, at, at Collingwood, he averaged 32 hitouts and 19 disposals a game. So those numbers aren't too far off his best. He kind of fell away in 2022, subsequently got traded, but I still think there is a chance that Brody Grundy comes on and it's particularly a team needing a Ruckman like that. I think there is a good chance he at least has a strong impact, even if he doesn't become an elite player again. Taylor Adams as well. He's uh, he's a 30-year-old midfielder, but we've seen over time his numbers have dropped slightly, but largely due to less time on ball. In particular, you know, two years ago, he was averaging seven clearances a game. That then dropped to five, and then this year it dropped to four as well. But interestingly, I did notice he was still top five in goal assists last year. He's still a good player player and Sydney have this knack of getting the best out of players that move to their club and I feel like the combination of Adams and Grundy probably will combined have the biggest impact for their new club. On a more individual level, uh, we'll talk about Lockie Schultz to uh, Collingwood. Obviously, this one, he's probably one of the most talented players to switch clubs in terms of like how good he is right now, uh, you know, compared to Grundy and Adams. Over the course of their careers, they've been better. But I feel like on talent, Schultz is right up there right now, um, bearing in mind the fact that it was kind of a modest trade period in terms of which players move clubs. But he kicked 33-19 last year. He kicked 30 goals 19 the year before. So he hits the scoreboard regularly. And he's also a very, very good pressure forward. Um, ranked fourth in tackles inside 50 in back to back years and I think he adds something that someone like a Ginevan certainly doesn't. That's not a shot at Ginevan. I just think there's a clear difference in production uh, when you compare the two players in the same role. Ginevan is younger but if we're talking about how it's going to impact Collingwood next year, I think this improves their best 22 and he absolutely slots straight into it. I've included Jack Gunston in the group. I'm confident of players that will impact their club really positive, positively next year uh, by virtue of the fact that he's just so damn good. So let's be real though, he has had some modest goal returns since 2018. I think he kicked over 50 that year but since then he hasn't kicked over 32 in a season, but uh, he also hasn't played more than 17 games in a season in that period. And I think he had one season there completely wiped out by injury. Last year, just the 22 goals from 17 games playing in a different system. Um, there was some suggestion that part of the reason he didn't really thrive at Brisbane was uh, game style related. And there was a little bit of friction, I think, between him and Fagan. That was just where I read. So basically, it's half an argument to suggest that if he goes back to that Hawthorne setup with an improved Hawthorne lineup as well, they're better than they have been over the last couple of years, then he could uh, have a really good year in front of goal. And I, I think because he's so prodigiously talented and Hawthorne are likely to improve, he's going to get more looks at it. Gunston's going to have an impact big time in next year, I reckon. Then I've included Liam Henry in this uh, for a number of reasons. So Liam Henry is the least capped player in terms of how experienced he is out of this group, but he is a former top 10 pick and he did take a little while to come on. I think he started his career as a bit of a small forward, playing more uh, uh, in the midfield and wing in particular this year at Fremantle. And his average jump from nine disposals from seven games in 2022 to uh, 20.4 from 16 games in 2023. And he also uh, played, you know, he was in the same at the end of 
of the year. So he became a best 22 player for them this year. He had three games of over 30 possessions. He's really gotten to that 40 to 50 game level now, and that's really where you see players of this level really start to take a leap. And I think with St. Kilda's needs, their list profile, he's mature enough to impact straight away, but also they have a need for outside running carry as well. So I think there's a good chance that Liam Henry comes in and really improves that best 22. Then we'll talk about some other players who move clubs. Then there is a little bit more speculative, but on the next tier down of impact, I've got Xavier Dersma and Jade Gresham as a combination. Uh, Dersma was selected in Port Adelaide's side that played in the finals, albeit he didn't play well. He played, he got seven touches in that uh, semi-final, but to be fair, Port Adelaide got completely poleaxed. His averages of disposals are, are a little bit modest, to be honest. He's uh, averages around about 15 uh, possessions a game, but he does have that dynamic potential, and I do think there is potential for him to add something different to Essendon's mix there. Equally, Gresham, we've seen a drop-off in numbers in recent times, but he is still good for a goal a game. As a as a forward midfielder, that's pretty much hitting the mark of what you'd expect and what you'd want. And furthermore, he adds some creativity to that Essendon forward line as well. So I think in terms of attributes, that's where I see these players improving Essendon's best 22. Not necessarily consistent output, but their creativity and maybe dynamism as well is what I could see adding there. So speculative, but I can see those guys having a big, big impact as well. Sorry, guys. I know the, the typical UK sun that the sun keeps coming out every five minutes and then going away since I started this video. So apologies if that's annoying. I'm going to include Marvio Chol as a speculative one as well because I think there's some real upside with this guy. Uh, just played the 10 or eight games this year uh, for 10 goals in a, in a side that also had Burgess and, you know, McLaughlin playing in the VFL, kicking goals and not getting a gig. It was, it was a hard season for a key forward to get a game at Gold Coast, evidently. But, you know, in his last full season at Richmond, he had 22 games and he kicked 44 goals. So he, there's a proven uh, aptitude and ability to play uh, as a key forward at AFL level and kick goals. That was in a year where Richmond played finals, obviously, as well. And again, make the same argument for Gunston. Now they've got an interesting new fresh forward line with Ginevan, Chol, and Gunston back in that team. You know, that's a, that's a really good mix and the young and improving midfield all the time. I can see Chol having a pretty good impact. If he kicks 30 to 35 goals, then that certainly ticks the box. Ben Mackay, I'm denied about a little bit uh, because I have talked him down a little bit in the context of, you know, North Melbourne getting pick three from the, this year. But what I will say, though, is that he was still the highest demanded key back talent available on this year's market. So he does join Essendon, who were obviously on the market for a key defender. They lost Zerk Thatcher. So if you compare the two, they're actually pretty hard to split, particularly on 2023 performance. Statistically, and it is difficult to um, you know compare defenders on statistics purely, but a similar level of intercepts, marks, and contested marks, and Zerk Thatcher's a fair bit younger. What is different between them, though, is Mackay has seven centimeters on him. So he's 202 centimeters, and that allows them to have someone to really match up on those tall key forwards. You know, the King Twins, for instance, his brother, Harry. So it does add something different there, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that he will have a good impact on Essendon, but it's again caveated by the fact that they lost a key defender as well. So you'd expect him to have some degree of impact, particularly for the price that they paid for him. Similarly, Esava, Radagalia, and uh, Zerk Thatcher joining Port Adelaide will likely have a good impact on them as well. I didn't put them in the top tier because frankly, they're not as decorated as the players above them or as talented in my opinion, but what they have done is refresh their back line and uh, now they've got some support for Elia there, Zerk Thatcher and Esava. That's a, it's a decent decent trio. So structurally, you can make the argument there is going to be a good impact there because while those aren't the most necessarily highly rated players, you know, Port Adelaide were relying on guys like Jonas and, um, you know, McKenzie was a key back for them. Tom Cleary, they made available on the trade market this year. No one, no one actually took him up on that. But from a structural point of view, this will help Port Adelaide. It'll be interesting to see their, their modest talents, if I'm being, you know, completely honest, but structurally we could see a good impact from those players coming into the side. Similarly, Ivan Solder joining Port Adelaide will also be an interesting one. They weren't clearly happy with their ruck situation this year, and they recruited two rucks, and Ivan Soldo is probably the better of the two, I would say. He's 27 now. He only played eight games for Richmond this year. Obviously stuck behind Nan Curvis there, but it was also his best year statistically. He averaged about 23 hitouts, and he's a good size at 204 centimeters. So I'm actually, again, cautiously optimistic that Soldo can come in as the number one ruck and actually start to make a bit of a name for himself. At the moment, his reputation probably does exceed what he actually has produced, but there is potential there and he will be given the opportunity as a number one ruck with um, Lysett and Sam Hayes in limbo. I have included Ginevan. Again, this is speculative because, um, again, despite his reputation, he is not necessarily the most proven AFL player. Uh, particularly this year, it would be a disappointing year, I think, for Ginevan on field. 
Yes, he was a premiership player and he was in the 22, but if you look at it, 12 goals from 14 games from a small defender that doesn't really tackle and doesn't get a lot of the ball. He averaged nine disposals and uh, less than a goal a game and one tackle a game. So he's got a bit of flair, a little bit of creativity, and uh, obviously Collingwood saw something in him. Obviously Hawthorne do too. And we have to acknowledge the year before, um, he had 40 goals from 23 games. So that is the actual reason he's in this video. Because of his proven uh, ability to hit the scoreboard, because if he hadn't done that, he probably would have been a delisted free agent. But nonetheless, he is a young developing player. Again, Hawthorne likely to improve. I can see Ginevan having a positive impact. To what extent, I don't know. And that's why I consider it a bit more speculative. And finally as well, the, the combination of Fisher and Stevens joining North Melbourne. As, again, I'll put that as speculative for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, talk about Fisher. This was actually one of his best years statistically in terms of how much he got the ball per game. Um, and he's probably earmarked for that halfback role to give them some run and dash. So yeah, you can see him bringing something positive to this team. He's also really experienced. He's played 107 games, uh, which will help North Melbourne from that point of view. But he averaged 21 touches a game. And uh, just, you know, as Carlton improved this year, just kind of got pushed out, which doesn't mean he won't be best 22 for North Melbourne. Stevens is probably comparable a little bit to, to Liam Henry and probably a little bit further back developmentally, but he's actually played 43 games as well, the same as Henry. He played 13 games this year, but did get dropped for the finals. He averages about 15 touches a game over the last two years. So the thing about Stevens that I like, he's got weapons. He's got speed, he's got skill on the outside, and again, adds something different to this best 22. So I think he'll be given a chance to, to play in round one if I had to guess, from the outside looking in. But again, it is speculative because he hasn't proven you know, nearly as much as Liam Henry, in fact, from what I've seen. But again, I think there's talent there. There's weapons, weapons arguably, that Liam Henry doesn't have. So you'd have to say bringing in two relatively experienced players uh, will help North Melbourne in the short term. Anyway, guys, that is just my take on the impact that uh, these recruits will have on their team in 2023. I've got plenty more content on the go. I did a little plan for the next two weeks. I'm going to try and do one to two videos a day still. Um, and uh, as always, I welcome your thoughts and comments uh, in the comment section below. So thanks for getting around the channel so much lately. I really appreciate you, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.